I'm Gary Jensen. I'm the Libertarian presidential nominee for president in 2016, and you are watching Facets TV. Amazing. Good for you. Hi, this is Rick Warren, and you're watching Facets Television. You're back here at AI Med with Facets Television, and with us today is Dr. Leo Anthony Selly. Dr. Selly is with Beth Israel Deaconess. That's correct. And we're going to talk about what Dr. Selly spoke about as in his presentation today. Welcome. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I was brought in as both a clinician and a data scientist. I work in the intensive care unit at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and I also am a principal research scientist at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And our research is, uh, focuses on secondary use of electronic health records. Um, we call it uh, secondary use because the primary use is for the care of the patient. But when you start aggregating data coming from um, all your patients and you start building predictive algorithms and looking at relationship of different risk factors and diseases, that's what we refer to as secondary use of electronic health records. So doesn't that though also in fact improve the outcomes for the patient as well? Yes, so yes. Um, but generally deriving uh, knowledge from uh, exploring this databases. Right, right. So um, what was the primary impetus of your presentation today? Um, it's primarily talking about the potential of um, secondary use of electronic health records. The way we practice medicine now is that it's basically informed by clinical trials. When you perform a clinical trial, you enroll a very heterogeneous group of people mm -hmm. and you try to measure an average effect. That's not very helpful when I'm taking care of a very specific patient. Uh, to determine whether a treatment is effective for this particular patient, it's hard to base that decision uh, on a single number looking at an average effect. What you would want in, in, uh, in, in theory would be a trial where they enrolled tens of thousands of clones of that patient where half of them were randomized to that treatment and another half were randomized to no treatment to determine if that treatment is really effective for that particular patient. Do you think this will open trials up to larger groups and, or do you think it's going to change the structure of trials? In, I in, think it's going to change the structure of trials okay. in general. And how do you think, um, what do you think we need to do from a legal construct in order to do that? Because I know there are specific rules around how you do trials. Do you see being involved in the lobbying of, the, of policy change as well? It's still going to follow the, the current structure in terms of um, making sure that you have approval from the Institute uh, Research Board. Um, but the way we conduct them, the design of the trial is going to be the one that will be different in the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. So what's most exciting to you about what you're doing in your research currently? Um, I think it's an exciting field to be in in medicine. We're trying to redesign, re-engineer the system so that knowledge creation is more efficient and more effective. Mm -hmm. And we actually don't know the design of or, or what that system is going to look like yet. And this is the reason why we're trying to engage as many brilliant minds as possible. Um, Interestingly enough, you mentioned knowledge creation. I know that in the early days of data processing, they didn't see it as consolidated data turning into knowledge. And it sounds to me like AI is the next step in that process. Is that how you see it? That's correct. Um, and we focus on electronic health records because we think that those are uh, digital capture of day-to-day -day experiments. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, the answers are not exact and the answers are not 
certain when we make decisions in medicine. So every day we're actually experimenting and the electronic health records are nothing but lab notebooks. And what we're trying to do here using artificial intelligence is to glean new insights from the day-to-day -day experiments that we perform. So what do you think are the biggest limitations on what you're trying to do? Is it a technical limitation? Is it cultural? Is it, you know, um, It's all of experience? the above. Okay. It's all of the above. Uh, cultural is a big barrier. Um, there are still issues around who owns the data. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the previous century, um, people are holding on to their data. Uh, one of the key messages of the conference is that the bigger the data, the more resolution you have with the data, the better the models, the more accurate the findings are. Mm -hmm. And if we stick to the previous century's approach where each one is holding on to their data, they're performing their analysis in silos, then we're not going to improve in the way we, uh, we create knowledge. Do you see social change coming in the, in, in the medical community currently allowing for that? I mean, um, There is a saying that science, including medicine, advances one funeral at a time, right. or one retirement at a time. <laughs> uh, we are really... That's kind of sad, but it's, but it's accurate. <laughs> yeah. We're focusing on the younger generation of clinicians because I think they are more uh, open to the idea of delegating a lot of the cognitive tasks to machines. And our vision of the future is actually exactly that, that we delegate the task that machines perform better to machines, and we focus on the things that we do better. And yeah. that is in uh, being able to explore the values of the patient and being able to explain to them the probabilities and uncertainties of the decision-making process mm -hmm. and giving more empathy rather than spending our time trying to integrate data, synthesizing them, because we think that the machines are more reliable in doing that. Well, and as long as the physician gets to make the, the ultimate decision, right? And the patient, the and the patient. Right, yes. well, or even the decision to provide the advice, I yes. guess would be the term. Then I don't see any problem with uh, physician enablement coming from every source. We were talking a little while ago about how in the old days, I used to have to go to an encyclopedia and read the mm. two paragraphs. Today, I can go Google and get this amazing amount of information. It's, it, it can't be wrong, you know? That's correct, but you'd be surprised that there is still a lot of resistance from the mostly older generation of physicians who think that they know what's best, that the machines didn't go to medical school and could not be expected to know better than them. Mm -hmm. But I think that attitude is hopefully changing, especially with the younger breed of doctors. And it'll make them that much better. From an education perspective, what do you think the education community needs to do best to provide you with the talent that you need to, to, to mold? As Medical education has to transform as well. In the past, um, one of the things that we ask them to do is to memorize facts. And at this age, there's no reason to memorize anything. Mm -hmm. I think the skill that we need is how do you get that information? Where do you get that information? Can you trust that information rather than memorizing drugs and, and diagnosis, uh, mm -hmm. differential diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. It sounds like you've got some fascinating things, and, and I know after talking to several people today that uh, I'm much more encouraged about the future of AI and medicine, so thank you for, for thank coming. Thank you. You've been watching Facets Television, and I'm Kevin McDonald.
Welcome back to AI Med here in Dana Point, California. And with us this afternoon is Dr. Martin Cohn at Centrion. He is also a co-founder of Tellit. Correct. Very good. Oh, I would shake your hand, but we're going to pass on that one. Yeah, How are you this afternoon? I'm doing well, thank you. Other than you? your, uh, your injury there. Everything else is fine, thanks. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, I understand you're a speaker today? Yes. And what is it that you were speaking on this afternoon? I was speaking about the potential for artificial intelligence to help us with the effort towards personalized healthcare. That's a, a, a policy goal for the future of improving healthcare, supporting the transformation of healthcare by being able to learn enough about individual patients mm -hmm. that the physician and patient can together make a decision that is more likely to be beneficial for that particular patient. So I also understand that it extends to home health care. That's correct. So what Centrion does is it works with patients that have multiple chronic diseases okay. to uh, try to identify patients who will get sick enough to need hospitalization three to five days before it happens. And we do this by integrating longitudinal health data about these patients with data collected from the home, measured data such as blood pressure or oxygen levels, um, along with patient reported data, okay. to look for patterns that suggest this patient has started to deteriorate um, from any one of multiple diseases and identify them early enough that a relatively modest intervention from their care providers can reverse the, the course and prevent them from getting sick enough to need hospitalization. So, so the AI is really um, understanding the pattern or the predisposition to that deterioration? For that particular patient, and Got that's it. the important distinction. Okay. Uh, because, you know, each patient with congestive heart failure is a little different. They're not all identical. Mm -hmm. Some of them have other chronic diseases, and some of them have a particular kind of congestive heart failure. So if you lump them all together as just having congestive heart failure, you, you miss a lot of opportunity. So by looking for patterns that are unique to that individual patient, basically creating a model, f uh, of a data model for that patient mm -hmm. that represents that patient's real world existence in his or her home more accurately, your opportunity to come up with a useful insight for that patient improves. So one of the questions I've been asking folks here is, is are you developing your own algorithms or using other people's engines and then putting overlays over it to understand it? How are you coming to your conclusions? Well, th these models don't exist. Okay. So we are creating them. Great. Um, most of what has been done at home monitoring up until now has been looking for very late stage things like a patient with congestive heart failure who gains two or three pounds implying fluid retention and worsening congestive heart failure. We are looking several days earlier than that mm -hmm. when, because most of all these patients, except for the most seriously ill, have some level of reserve. And until they've used up all that reserve, they don't actually become symptomatic. So we're looking for patterns that say they have started to intrude on their reserve. Um, that hasn't been done before. So we are creating okay. new models to try to identify the patterns that suggest this process has started uh, so that we can identify these patients early enough to give the patient and the care team to get together and work out an intervention. So are you pulling your data pools from your own localized ecosystem or are you extending out into the community to try to pull data from other sources at this point? Well, we're focusing on data from these patients. Uh, we okay. also get data from some of our um, clinical partners, uh, pre-existing data that right. they had collected from other sources. Got it. Um, and then each time we... Um, a, a new healthcare partner joins with us, we join all the data together. It's all anonymized. So, right. Yeah, you know, of course. Yeah. And so, you know, each time we bring on a new partner, we give them the advantage of what we have learned. But each healthcare organization, you know, has patients that have a lot in common with all the patients we've worked with so far. But, you know, each of them has their own idiosyncrasy. So mm -hmm. there's some more learning each time we add a new So it's that patients. subtlety and that nuance that you think is going to be the life-saving part of it, which is the, the, the individual understanding versus the pooling. Right. So, you know, we're not act truly at the individual level yet. We have some individualization. So, for example, instead of using arbitrary values like a blood pressure of 180, we establish a baseline for each patient and then look for deviations from that baseline. Fascinating. But the patterns are generated from populations. We have the ability to improve that over time. So we use a machine learning algorithm. So if we make a prediction this patient will get sick and the patient doesn't get sick, mm -hmm. you know, that's a false positive. Right. If we say this patient is going to get sick and they do get sick, that's a true positive. And all the, that 
it's fed back in. And so we have the ability, for example, to improve overall in our prediction for a given population, but we can also identify groups of patients within that population that are not being well served by the rules we have set up and needing a new set of rules. Mm -hmm. The more patients we have on the system for a longer period of time, the more, the smaller and smaller those sub cohorts of special patients yeah. can be, and that's on the road towards personalization. You also eliminate some of the noise, right? Some of the, 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 as you put it, the false positives, but the things that are interfering with the real data that you're looking to get to. Yeah. And, and that'll always be there. Right. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, helping to identify it. But, you know, that noise, uh, that misleading information will always be there, and you need to incorporate that in your probabilistic system. So from your practice and your goals, um, from your vision of use of AI, what tools, if you could choose to put a new tool in your toolbox, what would it be? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, there are so many opportunities out there. I think you just, you need to assess them all. So we use a, a fairly robust machine learning uh, system, but uh, with a variety of statistical analyses. Um, and. You know, one of the things you have to worry about, for example, is you know the, the idea of overfitting, of so narrowing the, the, the breadth of the analytics that you use that it works for only one population and can't be generalized. So we look for uh, systems that allow us to be broad, because if you're going to deal with hundreds of thousands of patients, um, you, you need to have something that you know, allows you to be reasonably accurate for that population and then focus on subpopulations, but not in such a way that you can't use what you've learned for the next population. So that differential, I think, that you pointed out, correct me if I'm wrong, and that is that if you're, if you're so narrow, really all you're doing is data analytics, or if you're not generalizing to a certain degree, it's not natural AI, right? I mean, isn't there a lim doesn't that kind of yeah. change the definition a little bit? I'm not sure if it changes the definition, but it, it just addresses one of the, the threats in AI is this idea of overfitting. Right. If, you know, if, if you give me a population, I can analyze that to death, so to speak, mm -hmm. and be 100% accurate for that population. But it doesn't carry over and it'll be useless in the next population. Right. So you have to have this balance of improving my accuracy for this population, but taking something from that that you can then bring over to the next group and still have reasonable accuracy and move on from there. So like the generalized tools, but not necessarily the tool set, I mean the uh, rule set for that particular use of the tool. Right, so it, ha it has to be something, you know, you, you can generalize and move over and improve upon. Oh, that's great. But, you know, you, uh, you can't, you, d you don't have anything of value if it's so specific to the one population that it, it provides no insight for anything else. So um, last question, what's the most exciting thing that you are doing right now that, that keeps you moving forward with all the work that you must do? Because no matter how much fun we're having, we're still working. Right? Agreed. And what we, we chose this particular target for uh, an important reason. Right now, the, the, the reality is that in the United States, 70% of what's spent on healthcare is for these patients with multiple chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the goal for the distant future is something called primary prevention. How much better off we would be if we could manage patients in such a way that we very much reduce the likelihood they'll develop diabetes or congestive heart failure or COPD. But if you're spending 70% of your money on patients who already have it, it's somewhat hard to free up the funds you need for a broad-based yeah, right, primary right. That care totally project. That totally makes sense, right, yeah. So if we can have a serious impact on this current burden, r reducing the, the care demands for patients with established advanced mm -hmm. chronic disease, mm -hmm. save that money, well then the opportunity for developing primary for, for prevention programs becomes better. Yeah. So um, that's what I'm hoping, is that we can have enough impact here that we can start to get to where we want to be is keeping people healthier longer rather than l limiting the, 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 the problems that patients with established chronic right, disease right. have. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us this evening. Thank you for the chance to be with you. I appreciate it, thank you. So you've been watching Facets TV. We are here at AI Med in Dana Point, California, and you have been watching Kevin McDonald and Dr. Martin Cohn. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to AI Med in Dana Point, California. And with us now is Nardo Manaloto. He's the CEO of Catalyze. Not only that, but he's a healthcare executive with decades of experience in technology and an award-winning problem solver. Thank you so much for coming in. I very much appreciate you talking with us today. Thanks for having me here. 
You're welcome. So I understand you're one of the speakers at the conference. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of a touch of what it is that you spoke about? I spoke about uh, emotion and use of emotion in artificial intelligence and using human sense, senses as a way to detect emotions. Interesting. So one of the things that I've been asking over several days is, is there a, re a, a real possibility that we will be able to mimic intuition? Is, is, is that something in the line of what you've been talking about? Yeah, intuition, if you really look at what intuition is all about, intuition is a combination of knowledge actually turned to wisdom, mm -hmm. right? So when people are intuitive, they pretty much have the experience and the knowledge plus the right set of emotion mm -hmm. to make that intuition happen. Interesting. Okay. So AI has a potential to actually do that, and that's when really the magic of AI begins. So do you, so that's interesting. You see two sides of it is the reading of emotion, and then the second, do you believe it will ever mimic emotion? Uh, there's actually work out there that's being done to mimic emotions, uh, but first we have to understand what is emotion, right? Uh, there are 16 different models of emotions right there that we have now, and we don't have a standard as to which one we should use. So the first thing is we need to understand that, and then the second is once you're interacting with, let's say, a computer or a virtual avatar, the virtual avatar can mimic your emotion, but not only mimic, it can actually produce a counter emotion. So for example, if uh, you're talking to an avatar mm -hmm. and, and you ask it a question and the avatar senses that you're angry, then the avatar could detect, oh, this person is angry, then maybe I, I'd be more, uh, the avatar will respond in a more calming ma manner mm, okay. as opposed to an angry manner. Right, right, right. So it won't actually mirror necessarily. It may actually have the intuition mm -hmm. to go the opposite direction. That, that's fascinating. Yeah. I haven't heard anybody tell me that. So from that side, um, on the technology side of things, where do you think we are in that technology curve and what you're talking about right now? In, the, in detecting the emotion, we're actually pretty early on. So the current standard out there is more around facial emotion detection, looking okay. at your face. But uh, humans, when humans look at emotion, it, they actually look at not just the face, the gestures. You know, they also listen to the voice, whether the voice has a certain tonality. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you can hear a slap on the table. It makes a sound. So emotions is a very uh, complicated uh, thing to decipher. Uh, so you need to look at all of that, record all of that, and then determine how you could uh, decipher or interpret what emotion that is. So I had spoken to another AI professional some time ago, and they mentioned that one of the primary things that we're going to have a problem with measuring emotion is the hormones and the chemicals that we give off that we don't really recognize, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it sounds like the machines are moving towards the ability to do that. Are you confident that that's coming in the next five, ten years? I mean, when do you see it? Uh, I s because there's so many different things that needs to happen f uh, for uh, true emotion to actually get uh, deciphered and interpreted. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to look at the facial component, you have to look at the chemical component, you have to look at gestural component, you have to look at context as to what happened within a scenario or situation, mm -hmm. why that emotion uh, came in. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there. I would say maybe in the five to seven year time frame you would see a really good uh, uh, impact there. So as the CEO of Catalyze, I'm guessing that you get to see really a lot of really cool stuff. And without giving away anything that's under the under the rug, what do you think is some of the most exciting things you're seeing right now? Uh, there's a lot of good work happening in the virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Mm -hmm. uh, drones definitely is uh, there. Uh, artificial intelligence across the board. Uh, computer vision. So there's a lot of these uh, technology that help you make smarter things. Uh, smarter homes, smarter robots, everything you will see around you will actually become smart. And there's also a good movement in the area of uh, natural computing, where you actually don't need to carry any more technology, let your environment sense you and be the technology. Interesting. So that also would, would make integration much more um, heterogeneous, I guess would be the way to put it. It would make it more, more uh, fully integrated. Yeah, and there's also uh, a lot of technology in the area, AI technology uh, happening in the area of uh, integration and in interoperability. So uh, we, the, the thing with technology is because it's so siloed and don't really talk to each other, the, the piece, uh, 
when it comes to AI, AI provides a lot of these I call plumbing, smart plumbing, mm -hmm. to make all the data talk to each other, uh, interpret the data, so it can provide meaningful uh, interactions. So with, with that said, what do you think is the biggest thing holding back successful AI in, in, in practice? Yeah, I think uh, one is there's definitely a, a little bit of fear uh, component to it. Uh, there's two camps. There's the camp of people believing on, in AI and uh, narrow AI and said based on create application that is narrow specific to a domain. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the uh, camp of AGI. AGI stands for Artificial General Intelligence in which you let the uh, AI algorithm learn. You don't teach it anything. You let it learn by itself and let it uh, decipher things around it and data mm -hmm. that it has mm -hmm. uh, to come up with its own conclusion. Well, I think that might actually go to Dr. Wen's conversation a little bit that we just had a little while ago about how um, the environmental impacts, the big picture stuff that could come in from general AI might actually improve the more narrow set in healthcare, because it'll understand more about you. Would that be accurate from your perspective? Uh, yes, it, it would be accurate. Uh, how, however, the work that needs to be done is really uh, how do you make interpretation? When you do narrow AI, there's always, uh, it's such a limited problem to solve, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, when you try to solve problems in healthcare, you have problems that is multi uh, multi-set, right? So you have a problem, let's say, in diabetes, and a diabetic person could have hypertension or uh, some heart issues. Mm -hmm. Those are two different domains. So you need to connect them, learn each vertical, but also connect them and see what the interconnections are and see if you can gain insights out, out of that. AGI can make that happen where typical AI, which is more on the narrow side, is probably going to be limited. So from the perspective of emotion, um much of medicine is, you know, it can be everything from someone being a hypochondriac to someone being depressed, the stress, the depression, whatever it might be that triggers a health issue. Um, do we see AI being able to sometimes identify that thing that we may miss as human beings? Do you see that as a possibility in the future? Uh, yeah, actually it's uh, doing that now. So you have application, what we call passive AI. So these are uh, technologies that just run in the background of your phone, for example. So when you're, whenever you're talking to someone in your phone, it can detect your stress level through uh, deciphering your voice, mm -hmm. right? And then it'll learn over time as to, based on the phone number, uh, who is it that's giving you a problem. Who's, who Don't is it call that give, person anymore. I yeah. <laughs> who, who it is is uh, kind of stressing you out. Right. And then at what time are you normally stressed out? Because it has a time component, right, during the day. It has a component of a phone number and a contact information. Mm -hmm. And then it also logs as to what subject it is because it deciphers the voice and uh, makes the voice into a text input. So you already have that kind of uh, capability now. So that's that interesting because, you know, some people can internalize stress like I do where it doesn't show outwardly, but I know for a fact there are certain things during the day that can trigger that stress. So mm -hmm. it would be fun to have a system that could tell me, by the way, that's what's giving you a stomach ache. It isn't this over here, right? Yeah, and, and, and normally the, the issue with that is more around making sure that the system knows your baseline. And baselines for one person is not necessarily the same for another. So the system still needs to learn about you. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that's only done over time. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's been a fascinating conversation. Yeah, thanks for having thank me Thank you here. so much. I'm Kevin McDonald. We are closing out at AI Med in Dana Point, California. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you'll come back soon.